Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Corey Dayharsh. I'm with Advanta IRA, and I'm here to bring you some educational information about investing with your retirement account into your community, whether that means uplifting and supporting uh, local businesses or local individuals. The focus of today's webinar is explaining to you some easy ways that you can take your retirement dollars and invest them so that they grow passive income while also supporting your community specifically. My name is Corey Dayharsh. Again, I've been with Advanta since 2016. I spent a number of years as a client account manager, processing day-to-day -day transactions and answering clients' questions about the rules and regulations for self-directed investing. And then about three years ago, I switched over to the business development team where I now work doing educational content like this, networking and building relationships so that we can continue to grow as a self-directed administrator and our client base can continue to grow as well. So Advanta IRA has been around for 20 years right now. Uh, 2023 is our 20th year. We've got about two and a half billion in assets under management held by our clients. All of our clients' funds that are not actively invested are insured up to FDIC limits, so the money is safe while it's sitting with us, waiting for you to decide where to place it. And again, as far as placing the money, each client of ours has a dedicated client account manager. I used to serve in that role, and that person's going to be your go-to one point of contact, so you don't worry about having a whole call center or explaining who you are and what you're trying to do to a new person every time you pick up the phone and try to do something with your retirement account. We try to offer that white glove concierge service so that it keeps things as simple and smooth as possible. You just need to know what you wanna do with your money as far as where you wanna place it and bring that to the table and we'll make everything else as easy as possible for you. So a brief disclaimer before I get into today's agenda. Uh, I am here to provide educational content. This is not specific investment advice. We do not provide any investment advice, legal advice, or financial advice in any capacity at Advanta IRA. So please build your own team or consult your own team of attorneys, accountants, financial advisors before you make any specific investments. Anything I show you from a standpoint of how to do something today is for educational purposes. Numbers are going to be rounded uh, just to kind of paint the picture of what's available for you. So my agenda today is I'm going to start by covering who can have a self-directed retirement account and what types of plans there are to offer, how you can use them to benefit your community and invest for yourself in your future. I'll have a few examples and case studies. And then if you, the audience, has any questions, I'll be very happy to go over those as well. Uh, there is a question box in your GoToWebinar panel. Go ahead and use that to jot your questions out to me. I'll try to see them as I go, uh, but if I do not and I'm in the middle of the presentation, I'll make sure I round at the end and answer anything that is posted into the questions box. So a few key takeaway points that I'd like to make sure that I express now and we'll Make sure we cover them at the back end of the presentation too. Self-direction allows you to invest how you want, not how you're told. You as the self are directing your own retirement fund. So finding your own deals, deciding what type of asset classes you want to invest into, or even what specific investment you want to make. There's no fiduciary or financial advisor holding your hand or telling you where you need to place your money or imploring you to do anything more than you want to do. And that team that you build, like I mentioned earlier, of attorneys, professionals in financial or legal capacities are guiding you with. You can create a local legacy while generating passive income for future generational returns. Uh, that is the whole basis of investing in your community, whether you're investing into a local coffee shop or a brewery uh, that you attend or would like to support or investing into real estate in your community to kind of rebuild some dilapidated buildings maybe or uh, provide affordable rent to someone in town. Uh, there's definitely great ways to kind of leave an impact where you live and where you like to invest your money while you're also generating returns. I mean, this isn't a, a lose situation because ideally here, you're still generating income for the investments you make. 
And again, I can't stress this enough, you are responsible for all of your own due diligence. So make sure you thoroughly read through any investment paperwork you're provided, subscription paperwork. Uh, you need to be comfortable in approving the investment uh, because if it does not pan out the way you expected, uh, that really does fall on your shoulders as a self-direct investor um, that you maybe um, you know, had the chance to look thoroughly through contingency plans if, if they outline that as far as what the investment is. Um, but those are the key takeaway points. I just want to make sure I cover those at the top. And uh, throughout the presentation, I'll kind of allude back to these and we may actually hit them specifically at the end of the presentation as well. So the self-directed IRA plans are basically most of the plans that you either already know about or uh, would expect to be self-directed. We'll start with the traditional and the Roth IRA accounts. Those are pretty standard retirement accounts in the US. Anyone that has uh, W-2 wage income or you know rank and file employment, uh, you can make a contribution into a traditional or a Roth IRA account. So a lot of people are familiar with those. A lot of people are also familiar with having a 401k plan or maybe a 403b or a thrift savings plan. But what not a lot of people know is when you leave those jobs and you had that 401k plan, you, as soon as you leave the job, have the ability to roll that money over into a self-directed either Roth or traditional IRA. It's completely your discretion. Uh, even the other types of IRA plans, but most people just roll straight into a traditional. And that's often referred to as a rollover IRA with some of our uh, other companies in this industry. We don't necessarily call ours a rollover IRA. It's just a term that can be used interchangeably with an IRA funded via rollover. But the point I'm getting at is when you leave a job that you had an employer sponsored retirement plan through, it's very easy and quick to pull that money out, move it into a self-direct account and kind of start making your own investments with that fund. Now, you otherwise could leave that money in that employer sponsored plan even after you quit that job but they don't necessarily have to allow your account to grow further from there. I have seen clients that have left their employer sponsored plan after they leave the job and that money sits in that plan but doesn't grow anymore as of the time they were terminated or terminated their employment. So make sure you are keeping an eye on things like that. Uh, it's always kind of surprising how many people say, oh, I had this retirement plan from a job I left eight years ago. I, I guess I should see what's what's going on with that money. So um, if this is a calling card to you out in the audience, go check on those funds, see what you can do with them or see what's been happening with them and how you can maybe utilize that fund better. And usually again, that's any employer sponsored plan that you're pulling out of. So a 401k, a 403b, a 457, reach out to me if you have questions, if you need some assistance and even asking the right questions to your current plan administrator or previous employer. Uh, and that can be done with a current employer as well. So as long as you're eligible for what's called an insert rollover, um, you are allowed to pull money out of a current employer retirement plan and roll it over into a self-direct account to make these types of investments. So that's another little tidbit of information for you. If you are someone that has an employer sponsored plan, you're still employed, you do not plan to quit that job, but you want to start self-directing, just ask the administrator if you're eligible within the plan agreement to do an in-service rollover. Now, getting back on track with some of the other plans here, we have simple IRA and SEP IRAs available for small business owners with little to no employees, and the solo 401k or individual K plan is also a employer-sponsored plan, so you do have to associate that type of plan with an employer entity or even yourself as a sole proprietor. That can support you and a house, but no employees. Once you're at the point where you're looking to hire employees, you would need a bit of a larger plan, which we can help facilitate you moving into, but we don't necessarily offer that type of plan. The other options that can be self-directed are health savings accounts. If you're someone with a high deductible health policy and education savings accounts, if you have someone in your life that could use some money set aside for their educational expenses. It's a great plan. You can put up to $2,000 a year into one of these types of plans for a child. 
And as soon as they no longer need the funds, it can actually be transitioned to a next of kin relative. So any money left in the account after they're done with all their schooling and all their educational expenses, that money can be handed off or that account more so uh, can be handed off to a next of kin relative. If you're someone in the audience that is wondering, well, I've never heard of self-direction. You know, how long has it been around? Is it a, a viable option? Why don't I know about it? It's usually because those larger companies that manage your funds for you have a vested interest in you staying with them and thinking that they're the safest, uh, most you know, viable option for investing strategies. Whereas it's not necessarily the case if you're someone that's already doing your own research, already doing your own investing, and you just need to tap into this extra resource or, or capital of money that you have accessible to you. That's why we're out at Advanta IRA putting out this education for free, letting people know that these are options. They've been around just as long as the other types of IRA investments and other types of IRA plans. And really, the statistic that strikes me is only about 4% of retirement accounts in the U.S. are self-directed. So in the grand scheme of things, there's about $40 trillion with a T dollars in the U.S.-based retirement system. Those account types I referenced a few slides ago, all in all across the U.S., about $40 trillion. And only 4% of that are people that are taking advantage of self-direction right now. So... Uh, again, expanding the knowledge, expanding the information, networking, letting someone actually do a self-directed investment, find out how great it is for them, and then sharing that with their family members, their friends, their colleagues. That is kind of the word of mouth advertising that we're trying to do, as well as the educational content here to bring some ideas to light. So I really want to take a second to express and differentiate contributions versus earnings because that's a common misnomer that people have when they make an investment and that investment starts to yield returns. Um, they sometimes reach out to us and worry, oh, is this going to put me over my contribution limit because I'm putting this money back in the account? Uh, no, that is completely separate. So the IRS limits how much you can contribute into a plan based off of your earnings from that year and you're making a new contribution you're taking money in either a tax deferred capacity meaning you're getting a tax right off when you put that money into your ira account or a tax free capacity meaning you are paying the taxes on it now but it goes into what's called a roth account and then it grows completely tax free from there so let's just say you maximize your contribution this year at six thousand five hundred dollars if you did that into a traditional account you get a write-off, so you get to tell the IRS when you file your taxes that you earned $6,500 less because you put it aside into this plan. Now, later when you take that out of the plan, however much that $6,500 grows into in the course of your investing journey, you will pay taxes on all of that money. So if you invest it for 30 years, and let's just say it turns into $65,000, you end up having to pay taxes on all that $65,000. That is contributions. The other side of contributions, and if it was a Roth contribution at 6,500 and you roll that into 65,000, you do not have to pay taxes on any of that because you paid taxes at the outset when you put the money into the plan. A separate capacity is the earnings that you generate from the investments you make. So let's just say you invested into a piece of real estate, you held that for rental income for a while, and then you sold it for a gain. All the income you're generating from the rental is just flowing back into your account as earnings. That's not against your contribution limit. When you sell that property on the back end, and again, the property's probably appreciated if you've held it for a long time or you've maybe done improvements to it, not only do you not pay any taxes on the earnings there at the point in time that you make the sale, there's no capital gains taxes to be paid because the investment's made in a retirement account. But also all of that earning flows back into your retirement account, not against your contribution limit. It's really important to find these deals with people you know. If you're in the community investment webinar here today, join your local network, whether that's your real estate investors association, go check those people out and that group out. There's uh, real estate investor associations all throughout the country. 
look on meetup or on your local forums to find where other investors are meeting in your community to find these types of deals a uh, very common term in the investment world is no like trust it's a triad there's usually a triangle drawn know the person like the person and then you begin to trust the person or group whatever it may be uh, again kind of a an ode to the disclaimer here build that network so that you're comfortable and you're finding the right deals and you have a support system around you that are going to help make those deals successful as well so before I get into the specific strategies, I just want to break down rules for these types of investments. So the IRS really does not have too many limitations on what you can and cannot do with your retirement account. In general, you're not allowed to invest into life insurance policy um, or hard to value collectibles like antiques, fine wine, artwork, anything the IRS would consider to be subjective in value are things they do not want to see you hold within your retirement account. I like to use an example. Uh, there's a house up the street for me that has an old mid-70s Corvette in the driveway, and it's rusty. It doesn't run. I think it's a piece of junk that's probably worth the scrap metal that it weighs, but I'm sure that the guy that owns the vehicle thinks that with a little bit of elbow grease, that it was going to be worth several thousand dollars um, and that, that's just a subjective value asset the irs would not want to see you owning that 70s corvette in your retirement account so just be mindful of things like that and as long as it doesn't fall into those categories life insurance or collectibles you're likely able to structure an investment asset in your retirement account as long as that doesn't have to do with disqualified persons so disqualified persons are easily identified as everyone up and down your lineal family tree. So that is your parents, your children, your grandchildren, your grandparents, anyone up and down that specific tree. This does not include cousins, aunts, uncles, uh, siblings. Those are not part of the disqualified persons list. But when talking about disqualified persons, you're not allowed to transact with them. So I can't use my retirement account to buy something from a disqualified person. I can't sell something to a disqualified person. I can't lend or borrow from a disqualified person. I can sit on the same side of the table for a deal with a disqualified person. So myself and my father can use our retirement accounts together to go buy an asset or join into a, a holding group that owns a business in town or something like that but I can't buy or sell my ownership from the disqualified person. The other items here listed on the rules are just little known taxes that only apply in a few scenarios. I'm not gonna get into those right here, but if you have interest in learning more, we've got specific content for them. Just reach out to me and I can point you in the right direction for UBIT or UDFI information. Here's a little bit more of an illustration on the disqualified person's rules. Uh, again, your family tree, uh, one thing I did not mention on the last slide, businesses owned or controlled 50% or more by any of these disqualified persons also count towards the disqualified person's rules. So uh, you cannot say, oh, my father owned a business and I bought the property from that business. That in itself would still be disqualified. So just to break down some of the asset classes that are allowed and that we see pretty frequently, um, to be honest, a, a about half of our client base are real estate investors in some capacity. So um, this slide does break down a lot of different ways that you can consider yourself a real estate investor, starting with uh, either a single or a multifamily home to provide affordable housing in your community. That can be for rental income. Uh, you can use voucher programs like housing assistance or the local housing authority, which actually helps vet out your tenants and pays a portion of their rent so a lot of people are apprehensive to use their retirement owned properties to partake or participate in the section 8 or hud programs but we actually see a lot of people do that and, and it helps out in a sense that your tenants are always trying to stay in the voucher program so they're usually going to do the best they can to upkeep your property and and keep paying on time and again they're they're in a program for assistance so 
usually the housing authority is also paying a portion of the rent as well. So you know you've got steady income flowing into your retirement account. Mobile homes or mobile home parks. So you can invest into an actual unit and own a deed to an actual unit, or you can invest into a whole park if that's something viable and available in your community. Uh, again, making that type of investment helps keep those affordable living situations available in your community. And you can also have a hand in keeping them kept up well uh, so that you're not, you know, driving down the road in your community and seeing a dilapidated mobile home park or something like that. It's a way for you to put your money to work and actually help benefit those different situations. Syndication and private placement investment, that usually comes into play when there's developers putting up maybe college housing or other types of multi-use complexes and things like that. So when you're investing into a syndication or a private placement, you're getting a full review of what they plan to do with the investment, but then you do not have any day-to-day -day decisions or responsibilities. You're going to be what's called a limited partner investor. So you're putting your money up. You've read through their PPM usually. It's called a private placement memorandum, a prospectus, and you see what their full intention is to do with your money once they receive it and what the total timeline of the investment is supposed to be any potential exit strategies, if there's an option for an early exit that can yield you great returns. Uh, those are great strategies for people that are either familiar with them already or just looking to place your money, have it be in something somewhat steady and stable and not have to think about it once the investment's actually funded. Commercial property, raw land and option contracts are commercial properties very similar. Raw land, uh, can be farmland for farming, can be timberland, just basically owning a piece of property that's not developed, developing it potentially with your residual retirement account funds, or just letting it be, as I listed here, uh, maybe camping or recreational grounds for uh, farming or even hunting, things like that. And option contracts, if you're someone that's just starting out and has a lower balance, you can actually, uh, put an offer in on a property to buy it. Once you have the property under contract, you can option that off to other people so that maybe you find the deal, you collect what's akin to a finder's fee for then passing that deal along in that contract, that locked in price to buy that property to another investor. So a few other alternative investments outside of the real estate class. The first one is actually relatively still associated with real estate which is a secured loan. So you can use your retirement account to be the bank. You can be a mortgage lender with your retirement account. It's really just executing a loan agreement where a security instrument's recorded in the county with the deed uh, at hand. So if the borrower does default on the loan, you can claim whatever that security instrument is, um, calling back to the disqualified rules or the prohibited asset classes you should not have a vehicle as your security instrument because if you do have a borrower that defaults and you do have to claim the security instrument and it happens to be something you're not necessarily supposed to hold in your retirement account, well, then you're in a bit of a pickle because you need to get that out of the retirement account as quickly or efficiently as possible. It's not prohibited to do that. I'm just alluding or referencing that you should keep in mind what item you're going to have as your security instrument to the borrower. Uh, so that if you do have the unfortunate situation that you have to claim that security instrument, you know exactly what and how you're going to facilitate the next steps. You can also do loans without a security instrument, just an unsecured promissory note, private loans. If you're very comfortable or very familiar with the person you're planning to borrow to, as long as it's not a disqualified person, that's completely your discretion and your right. You just have to come up with the terms. So you exactly, as I just said, decide what the interest rate's gonna be, what the repayment terms are gonna be, if there's gonna be a balloon date, that's completely between you and the borrower. Once you agree to that, you provide the details and information and the note document to your client account manager and they facilitate that transaction to send the funds out to your specific borrower. Private placements in a non-real estate capacity, there are private placements outside of real estate. Um, I alluded earlier to maybe investing in your local coffee shop or a brewery or something like that. So that can be structured as a private placement or it can also be structured as a startup company where you're getting specific like shares of ownership, like share or stock certificates, private stock, if you will, 
into those entities. Tax deed and lien investing, very similar uh, to options contracts. Those are great strategies when you have less money in your account, but you're trying to get started. Actually owning farm animals if you're in a rural community is something you can do as well. So you can provide local source livestock to your community by holding those types of uh, physical assets, um, whatever they may be. I've, I've seen alpacas and llamas held in retirement accounts. We've seen um, thoroughbred horses. We've seen people that have owned bulls, like bull riding bulls for uh, reproduction purposes. And there's actually some great returns to be made if you're in that avenue and, and kind of have that interest already aligned to just build your retirement strategy into it as well. And then movie projects. It's a little known thing that you can do is, is actually support and finance movie projects with your retirement accounts. So if you're in a community that's not so rural, uh, maybe you're on the West Coast and, and you're kind of in that Hollywood area and you know you want to support a movie project or even a grassroots option, uh, there's ways you can do that as well. So I've got a few case studies that we're going to go over today and then we're going to probably round up and end the webinar after these case studies. So again, if you have any questions from what I've been talking about or just that I'm bringing up in your mind, please use the questions box and go to webinar to jot those over to me. And I'll get through them uh, as soon as I see them pop up. So my first case study here is helping a startup business. We've got David and he wants to invest into Sarah's startup. Sarah's a neighbor looking to start a coffee shop business in her community. She speaks with David, just a neighbor from up the street, about her plan, and he decides to invest $10,000 of IRA funds to help her get started. They discuss a few options and they decide to structure it as a personal loan where Sarah is going to receive $10,000 and pay back at an interest rate of 10%, and the loan's going to mature in 12 months, at which time she'll pay David's IRA back in full. So Sarah receives the much needed capital to help get her coffee shop off the ground, whether that's securing uh resources to actually bring in the coffee or the materials to grind it and produce it and the coffee maker or even getting the rent and the lease agreement whatever she needs to use the money for david's not involved in that because he's just signing over a personal loan and sarah's responsibility after 12 months is to pay back the ten thousand dollars principal plus the ten percent interest on that ten thousand dollars as well the second case study here is buying and selling option contracts. So again, this is kind of getting into the real estate sector of how you can improve and impact your community. I've got a woman named Natalie. She's a well-connected real estate investor who's just getting started with retirement investing. She finds a distressed property in a highly sought after part of town. Everyone knows that one house on the block that's kind of just bringing the eyes down for everyone else. Um, she decides that she wants to put a contract on that property to buy it for $150,000. Upfront, her IRA pays an escrow deposit or an earnest money deposit of $2,000. Then she reaches out in her local network in her community and finds someone that really wants to buy that property for $150,000. So she sells them the contract or the option to buy the property for $5,000. So she put up $2,000. She sells it to someone else for $5,000 and essentially generates $3,000 in profit for herself and through her retirement account and also hands off that property or the contract to buy the property at $150,000, the rate she locked in when she put the property under contract, to a local rehabber that she has in her network that she trusts and knows that they're going to do right by that property, whether it's updating it, whether it's demolishing it and putting a new property on the land, um, whatever that may be. It's just, again, a great strategy when you're starting out with a little bit of money to just build chunk by chunk and get that built up balance to next time around, maybe buy that property for the $150,000 and hold it for rental real estate yourself. And then my third case study here, we're going to look at investing into a syndication. So I've got Jane and John. John has over $100,000 in a managed IRA with a financial advisor company or a fiduciary company. He connects with investor Jane, who put together a private offering to purchase a local apartment building. Jane and John discuss the subscription documents and the prospectus, as I referenced earlier. He does thorough due diligence, consults his team as needed, and decides he does want to invest. So John's going to open up a self-direct account, complete a transfer to move the money over into the new plan, 
on the back end, Advanta IRA submits that transfer request and also works with Jane to get the investment paperwork started while we're waiting for the money to come in from that other retirement company. So that basically as soon as the money hits the account, John's already approved the paperwork, we execute the transaction and send the funds over to Jane and her team. That's the basic general partnership of the syndication. So again, our role here is making sure the paperwork is all in the right name of John's retirement account, not John as an individual. His tax ID number is listed for the retirement account, not his social security number. So there's no tax consequence for the investment or the proceeds generated by the investment. And we execute and send out the funds once we re receive John's approval and authorization of everything. So for a rounded example of how an investment like this would pan out, Jane pays 8% preferred distribution to all subscribers. That's $8,000 a year to John's IRA. In the fifth year, the project is refinanced and John's IRA receives a lump sum of $130,000 for the initial $100,000 investment. So you're looking at a total earnings over the course of a five-year investment of $40,000 in preferred distributions and $30,000 as the lump sum chunk at the payout. So that is a five-year investment of $100,000 that yielded $70,000 of earnings. Again, rounded numbers, but possible. This is something that you could see legitimately with a syndication investment. It's up to you to find that deal, find the right Jane in your local community that has these offerings. I believe this is the final case study I'm going to cover today. This is just purchasing actual real estate. So whether you're doing a buy and hold or a fix and flip, the same press and, and tenants here are involved. So we've got John, another John, who's got $150,000 in an old 401k plan from a previous job. And he wants to purchase a rental property down the street from his house for $100,000. At that price point, again, don't look at the price points too much, but maybe it's a distressed property or maybe he has a relationship with the person trying to sell it that is not a qualified person. So John sets up a self-direct account, makes the offer to purchase the property and gets the offer in the name of that retirement account while we are working to get the funds into the account and then starting to work with the title agency or closing agent to coordinate the proper titling on all the paperwork these are cash to close transactions in 90% of cases because the retirement account has all the money to buy the property. So the turnaround time can be rather quick, but also John has the discretion to set that and, and do his due diligence and get his uh, earnest money time as he needs. When the transaction's executed, Advanta IRA signs all the paperwork after we collect John's approval, and we actually get the recorded deed sent straight to our office to hold for safekeeping purposes. John can have a copy of it or at a specific request, he can hold that himself. But by default, as the account administrator, it is our job to safe keep and record keep all of those documentations and make sure the income of the property and the outgoing expenses of the property are all facilitated through the retirement account, not through John's pocket or personal uh, funds at all. Everything here should be facilitated through that retirement account specifically. So let's just look at this scenario if John wanted to rent the property. Very similar to the loan situation I referenced earlier, John's the one that has to find the tenants and decide on the terms, whether that's the specific amount of time that the uh, lease is going to be, the specific dollar amount for the rent, if he's going to allow pets or not. Those types of things are completely up to the account holder. Once we receive that paperwork, we will make sure John approves it and execute it on behalf of the retirement account or the landlord, if you will. And also if John doesn't want to have that much of hands-on responsibility here, he can actually employ a property manager. Keep in mind when you're researching property managers, they're gonna charge for their services. So it's uh, cutting through a little bit of your margins on the investment returns, but if that's worth it to you and it, cuts a little bit of the actual responsibility out, that is your cross to bear, if you will, that is your decision to make and, and kind of due diligence to, to go through. So managing the property once it's owned in a retirement account, calling back to the disqualified persons rules, yourself and your disqualified persons are not allowed to do any sweat equity on a property owned by your retirement account. Even if you were partnering on this property and your retirement account only owned 5%, 
of the property overall, you're still not allowed to do any sweat equity. So this has to be done by non-disqualified persons. You as the account holder and IRA owner can inspect the work. So you are allowed to like step foot on the property and make sure everything's done up to quality and standard, but you just can't be changing light bulbs or like this gentleman here doing any plumbing under the sink or anything like that. You can look it over and there's no specific requirement for these laborers, if you will, to be licensed and insured. So really you can find a local handyman you trust and just have them on staff for these types of things. Um, there's no rule or regulation there, aside from that that person not be a disqualified person to you. Paying the bills all flow through the retirement account. As I mentioned earlier, we have an online portal that clients can log into to submit any payments that need to go out. We typically hold an authorization on file for your standard expenses, like your electric, your gas, your, your water and sewage. So we'll have an authorization from you on file usually. And when those expenses come in, we just pay them automatically. So we'll receive the direct invoice from your electric company at our office and we'll process that out as long as we have your payment authorization on file. For non-recurring expenses, you just submit those to your online portal or via email to your client account manager, and we usually get those cut out the same or the next business day, depending on when the uh, requests hit our inbox. Or again, you can defer to a property manager to handle all that, and then whatever residual income they have on a monthly or quarterly basis, they just send into the retirement account as a deposit. So with this case study, Going back again, the property was purchased at $100,000, but he had about $150,000 in the account. So um, I didn't reference here, but consider there may have been some upgrades that needed to be done to the property. There was money in the budget to do that. If a new roof needed to be put on or flooring or any major updates, there was money in the budget for that, but I'm not involving that in this kind of outline here of how the strategy panned out. So it was rented for two years at $1,250. That's $30,000 of income generated. The property was sold after two years for $150,000. So that generated a $50,000 profit. Again, no capital gains because this investment was made in a retirement account. And that money can now be used to make other investments, whether there's another property up the street that John wanted to invest into, or he wanted to go invest with another local business and maybe help another company get off the ground, like I referenced earlier with the coffee shop, that money is back in the retirement account, ready to be deployed into any self-direct strategy that this investor may want to do. So we are rounding home here. I just wanna share with you guys, I appreciate you for participating in today's webinar. We do a lot of educational webinars like this. We typically put out two a week on Tuesday and Thursday. They're usually recorded live from 12 to 1 p.m. and they, go up on our YouTube page, usually the very next day. And anyone that signs up for them, if you can't attend live, gets an emailed copy just to make sure you do receive that content that you had interest in. So check out either our events page on our website or our YouTube page, YouTube slash Advanta IRA. And if you're interested in more specific industry standard news, you can check out our blog on our website as well. If you're in the Tampa Bay area, the Atlanta area, or I am located in Western North Carolina, uh, check out our local events that we may be putting on in person. We do some events where we're either sponsoring out in the community or at our offices uh, pretty frequently in the past. So just check those out on our events page. You'll find anything we've got going on. And we also have a podcast I want to reference as well. It's called the Alternative Investing Advantage Podcast. My colleague Alex Perney hosts that and brings on some great guests, some great industry leading speakers to talk about their world of investing and, and uh, kind of give you a different insight outside of the real strict educational components here. That's a little bit more free flowing conversation and information provided with that podcast. It's really easy to get started with a self-direct account. It takes people about 15 minutes to complete our application. Once the application's completed, it usually takes about 10 to 14 days, speaking conservatively, um, to get the account funded. And then you can make your investment really as soon as the seventh day after your account's been opened. But giving yourself about a two-week window before the deal has to be funded, I think, is a conservative, reasonable way to approach it. I do see a few questions uh, that came up. If you have any other questions, please add them as we will be wrapping up momentarily. 
the first one I see here, isn't screening a tenant providing a service to the IRA? I can see the point you're trying to make there with that, but it is something you're allowed to do because it is your retirement asset and you're allowed to decide who you want to be the tenant or the, the leasee in that situation. So I can kind of see the, the context of the question, but it is not disallowed. You're definitely allowed to screen that tenant, do your due diligence, and make sure you, again, decide on the terms as well. You're coming up with the terms of the uh, the lease or the loan, whatever it may be. So that is allowed. It's always been allowed to my knowledge and my experience. And again, I've been with the company for about seven years and processed thousands of transactions. Uh, showing the property, et cetera, these are duties of a property manager. Well, in that case, sure. Showing the actual property um, is something that if you have a property manager, you should utilize. You probably don't want to be on site or or boots on the ground while that's going on. Unless you are not employing a property manager, then that does default to your responsibility and, and it's perfectly allowed to do that. Again, I allude to the fact that you shouldn't do any sweat equity. So really boiling down to even changing a light bulb you're not supposed to do. Uh, so I'd steer clear of those things, but if you're just showing the property and deciding if you get a good feel for that person and, and you would be comfortable with them being your tenant, that's all well and allowed. I don't see any other questions coming in. so. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up at this point in time. I hope you all have enjoyed today's webinar, learned a little bit maybe about how you can get better control and decisions with how your retirement account's being utilized and also some options to help support your community. Again, um, investing in your community is, is a great way to lay a foundation for those coming after you, your children, your grandchildren to know, oh, uh, my grandmother, my grandfather helped this coffee place started or, or invested into that piece of property on Main Street right there um, or invested into that shopping mall that used to not have any cool businesses in it and now it's got a nail salon and a coffee shop and an ice cream shop. Uh, those are great things that you can do. You just need to have a little bit of insight like I've hopefully provided you today and if you need any more insight or any more uh, questions that you have, please reach out to me. My contact information is here on the screen. I'd love to hear from you and help however I can. Thank you very much.